Good evening, everybody. Um, bienvenidos. My name is Kimberly DeSerpa. I'm the board president, and I welcome you tonight to our meeting. We're glad you're here. If you'd like to speak on any agenda item tonight, you need to fill out a yellow speaker card in the back and bring it up to Ava, who's sitting here on the end. If you are in need of translation services tonight, our um, translator, Yorania Lopez, is over here. And Eva, if you could say that in Espanol. Así ocupa servicio de traducción. A la señora Urania puede ayudarles con un aparato para ese servicio. Thank you, Eva. Um, tonight, our Pledge of Allegiance will be um, delivered by Chris Soto. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we'll have our superintendent comments from Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, thanks so much. So at the last meeting, I said that um, within the next day or so, we were going to have two students um, do community leader for a day with me. And we wound up having a really wonderful day. So Andrew came from Watsonville High School and Mia from Aptos High. We were able to um, do some meetings in the morning, work with um, stop Stop Violence Now community group. Um, then we went on, did a site visit, and then we met Senator Laird at the Wellness Center. Um, and he really spoke to the incredible work that's happening there. I also just, um, right before the meeting, got an got a email from Ann Solda where a parent at their, at their latest meeting stood up and really spoke to the impact of the Wellness Center and the food that she receives there, both the hot meals from Martha's Kitchen and um, the meals from the pantry. And so um, we're proud of that work. And then um, on Tuesday, I had my first of the year superintendent student advisory. So I've been doing that for about four years. This year, we expanded it and are doing it during lunchtime. And so we have about 40 students signed up um, for that. Um, I appreciate food and nutrition services, as you know. Um, many students um, often complain about the food that they receive, so we were able to have an explanation of the requirements that we have to adhere to. And then their favorite part, they did some case testing to determine new products, um, new foods that are going to be on the menu next semester. So I appreciate Food and Nutrition Services. They had all of their, they had their buyer there, their two nutritionists there, and um, their director, Jeannie, was there to um, support and listen to students, and they felt heard. Um, so thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. On uh, item 3.4, governing, governing board comments and report on any standing committee mem membership. Jennifer Holm, would you like to? Good evening, everyone. I know we've got a lot of public comments, so I'll keep it short and sweet. I attended the district uh, benefits committee meeting. Uh, we reviewed options and discussed challenges of maintaining a provider network um, and also attended our Pajaro Valley Education Foundation meeting and we're planning our superhero run on December 10th. Hope everybody who's interested in doing a fun uh, 5K will join us for me. Thank you, Trustee Soto. Yeah, thank you. President DeSerpa. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us evening, this evening. Uh, I had the pleasure of being invited to speak at the Veterans Celebration at the Mellow Center come up, coming up this November 11th. So I look forward to celebrating and meeting uh, some of my fellow veterans from the community. So thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for that. Uh, and uh, let's have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you um, so much for joining us um, this evening. I also attended the Power Valley Education Foundation meeting. So we are excited, as Trustee Holmes said, um, to uh, organize our first um, annual um, 5K, 1K Superhero for Kids race. So it will be held December 10th. Um, we have our Facebook event up and running. So please make sure that you sign up. It's $40 for adults and $5 for and again, the proceeds benefit classroom, the students, 
and the initiatives that the foundation is moving forward. I also uh, got to attend the Esperanza Community Farms tour uh, last weekend. They are a good partner in moving the uh, cafeteria, farm to cafeteria program uh, currently at Paro Valley High School. So it was really neat to connect uh, with their organization, um, the farmers there, um, and it was all fun all around for my kids and family. I also attended, I was invited by the NorCal Carpenters um, local union uh, to the Women in uh, Construction annual event hosted up in uh, my blanket on the city, New York Gilroy, I would say that. And so it was nice to see just how uh, the makeup of the apprenticeship program and career pathways is uh, made up. And I think it will be interesting to see how we can further collaborate with uh, those shorter programs to continue to uh, build upon our own career path here at. Thank you. Shocker. Good evening. Thank you, everyone, for spending your evening with us. I just want to do some acknowledgments. I want to thank our teachers for all their hard work and extra work that they've been doing, um, giving up their prep time and subbing. I hope an MOU for um, guaranteed prep time comes through soon. I want to also thank our transportation workers for doubling up on their route. You know, they've been working hard trying to get our kids to and from schools. And um, I know we're in negotiations, so hopefully we'll see those sunshine. Um, I attended our PVFP meeting also. Um, I also had an art council meeting this evening. Art council gives away some Spectre art grants Calabasas is one of our schools that was receiving a grant, as well as um, Watsonville Charter School of the Arts will be receiving a grant. And they have some family paint nights happening. Um, so stay tuned for some fun information from them. They're doing um, an event with PVUSD on October 22nd, a Dia de los Muertos altar making, and a um, dance class is going to be on the agenda. And then I've been visiting various sites. Um, throughout the district and also had the opportunity to work at the Starlight groundbreaking for their Emerald Lagasse kitchen and garden project and it was great to see how many community members and teachers and staff volunteered their time to help that project possible. Thank you. Um, we have a really packed house tonight, and I know a lot of you are here to speak on some very important issues, so I'm just going to keep it real sweet. I just wanted to take a quick moment and acknowledge um, and thank uh, Watsonville Police Department for the National Night Out that they hosted last Tuesday, October 4th. My family and I had the privilege and opportunity to go to several of the different events located in different areas throughout Watsonville, um, and it was very well received throughout the community. People were hosting things with in their homes and churches and apartment buildings, different places. And I would just like to encourage us as a district um, to look, um, especially with our inner rate, inner um, governmental relations committee, to maybe have conversations going forward with uh, the city of Watsonville about collaborating with them on those events and maybe opening up some of our school sites um, where we have definitely bigger areas that we can host those and um, be a part of that collaboration with them. Thank you. Thank you. And Doug Jr. Good evening, everybody. Um, glad to see everybody here. We're here to recognize a lot of people, different group of people from Watsonville, so I'm glad everybody's here. Uh, just briefly, I wanted to say I attended the Watsonville School Site Council. Um, if, if you want to get your voice heard or you want to let people know What's going on at the high school? I encourage people to enjoy to um, to join the school site council. Um, I just wanted to also echo. I think that's great, Trustee Soto, that you're going to be part and recognize the Veterans Parade. Um, I've been attending the last few years, and I, I think I think it's great we continue to support our veterans, our friends, um, the people from the past, our present. Uh, you know, thank you, you know, to the veterans and everybody, and it, it, the veterans are an important part of the people of Watsonville, and I always try to say thank you. Um, just also, um, just thank you, thank you very much, everybody, and I'm glad everybody's here. Thank you. 
And I think we're going to move item with part of the night. It's the high school student board representative report. Point five. I watch the high school. Good evening, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Michelle Rodriguez. My name is Luzma Tesuma, and I'm a current Diamond Tech senior and also the ASB president. We're excited to catch you up on everything we have been doing this year. At the beginning of this year, Diamond Tech was recognized once again as the National Gold Medal recipient for the college and career preparation. This is the third year we have received this distinction and we are honored to be named a gold medal school. Diamond Tech's, Diamond Tech's character education theme for this year are self-control, caring, humble, and generosity. Each quarter, the student council and staff identify students who are recognized by these characteristics. Once again, Diamond was able to offer the leadership summit for the ninth, for the incoming ninth graders. The focus was on getting the new ninth graders ready through a goal setting, team building, and preparation for success at Diamond. Our day one, two, and three sessions at the beginning of the school year focused on continued team building, mindfulness, and character education, as well as student success. Our school wide theme is revealed during this time, which is choices, changes, Chances and changes. It's about making the choice to take a chance to make a change. We have had a lot of school activities since the beginning of this year. We had a wonderful back to school night in August. Your future is our business and Diamond Tech have launched the 10th and 11th mentorship program. This is an extremely important and valuable program for our Diamond Techies. Our beach volleyball team is doing really well. We are working hard to defend our championship from last year. We always celebrate September 16 in our Diamond Tech style. It was a fun spirit week with flower making, games, and a lot of school spirit. We will be also having our fall La Pulga on Saturday, October 22nd. And you can scan this QR code for the vendor application, or call, you can also call the school. The event gets bigger and bigger each year, and it's a great way to clear out your closet and garage. Vendor spaces are $20, and seniors will be selling boxes this year. If you don't have anything to sell, there's no problem. You can come by and enjoy the pool. Also, several students organized a trash pickup day at Ramsey in September. It was a lot of fun, and it was also a great way to get back to the community. It is also project time at Diamond Tech. The World Series of Innovation Challenge is launching in business classes. We are looking forward to all of the amazing project ideas and hoping we end up in the top 10 finalists again this year. WSI is where all students at Diamond Tech create a business aligned with the United Nations goals for a better world. Our agro science classes have been busy with everything from building a science fiction museum to soil chemistry and influential sciences. Also, our engineering students started off with a traditional egg drop and a an also traditional um, scroll obstacle. In our digital media class, there have been one point perspective projects, flash photos, paper experiments, and preparing for Watsonville Film Festival submissions. Thank you again for the opportunity to share what we have been doing at Diamond Tech. And if you would like to know more about, don't be hesitant to stop by in our website and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and come check it out. Once again, thank you, PBUC. Thank you, Luz. That was a really great presentation. We have Watsonville High School here tonight. Presentation. Thanks for coming tonight. Hello, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Uh, Rodriguez and members of the board. 
Thank you for having us here. My name is Moriel Mamarel, and I'm grateful to be one of the board reps for Wasanwa High School, as well as the co-ASB president. As well as me, I am very excited to be here. I am Selena Salvador, a co-ASB president. Um, and my name is Sandra Medel, and I am as co-president. So starting off, uh, we had our homecoming, and that was last month. We had it in September 19th to 23rd. And throughout that whole week, we had spirit days. We hosted them all throughout the different days. We had one called Y2K, which was a fun one. Uh, we brought back the 2000s, and so people were wearing, like, wired earphones. And someone even brought, like, a CD player, so that was really cool. <laughs> um, we also had our annual parade, and that's always super busy and fun. Uh, we had floats. We had over four, uh, 20 uh, participate, and it's always super hectic, but it's really rewarding being on that float and just going around town and waving to all the people. And uh, we also had our dance. So we had 600 people attend, which is crazy. Uh, we exceeded the number of people that came to prom last year, so that's just to put it in perspective. Um, by the way, our theme was music. Uh, to universal language, and we just wanted to kind of highlight and recognize the power that music um, has. And so lastly, we also had a, dan uh, a game. Uh, it was a football game against Scott Valley, and uh, it was also a really great time. We had an up-and-coming school band there. Uh, they had their drums and everything, and it's a really nice time to just uplift everyone and build that school spirit. Um, thankfully, things have calmed down quite a bit after <laughs> the chaotic monstrosity that is homecoming. And uh, Selena here will tell you more. So we started Hispanic Heritage Month on the 6th of September with the food day sale and car show that had over 20 clubs and over 16 cars. And we'll go through Dia de los Muertos on, on November 2nd with the community made all. Um, we are honoring and celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month include staff appreciation posters, student family posters, and we are raising social awareness. So National Coming Out Day was yesterday, and in the quad, hosted by our Saga Club and ASB, we celebrated everyone for who they are and expressed their feelings. Identity, sorry. <laughs> we had a bracelet making booth, a walkthrough door, which was optional, a rainbow mural made by Notes of Support and Kindness. We also had goodies given away. So during October, we also have the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And on Wednesdays, we were pink to wear, um, to kind of show our support. And along with that, we are selling merch that uh, one of our ASB peop, um, students designed. It's the cat support one. It goes on tote bags. And we also have pink socks that are available, as well as long sleeve shirts. Um, we also are doing in an advisory door kind of competition where everyone gets to decorate their own. and. We get to judge them and give out donuts to the winning class. <laughs> um, also, if you're wearing pink on Wednesdays, uh, you get a kiss and a pink ribbon, not a literal kiss like the chocolates. <laughs> um, and the pink rib ribbons are cool because um, they're on little pin bags, and so you can just stick them on your clothes, your backpack, to show your continued support throughout the whole month. Change for change. Um, Watmo High is fundraising money to donate to Relay. For live, it's a fundraising event, the American Cancer Society. We will be doing this during advisory and athletic. And we also have three pink, three pink out games to support Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which would be volleyball, tennis, and football. We will also be collecting cash and change during those games. Um, so today we actually had the PSAT exam for all Watmo High students who were interested. Um, we also had a college application toast that happened last week, which it went great for fun. Um, and also the science classes had a performance test last week, which also went great. And we are also starting after school tutorials for students who need help, and which leads us to recently starting Saturday schools, which is an outgoing effort to address parties and absences, especially for seniors to make sure they graduate. And lastly, we wanted to address our dress code. Uh, this was a big thing that happened in the beginning of our school year. But we are luck lucky to provide you on an update. And so we have set up regular meeting times. We have dates and um, certain times that we have with our principal, Dr. Fernandez. 
And we're also actively working with Watsonville High School admin to make sure that student voices are heard and we want to amplify their concerns and also um, recognize uh, the effect that it has had on our school. And so currently our latest uh, big update is that we started a Google interest form which will be distributed soon. Um, it's to form a committee that will work on the process of Revi revising and also just hearing out um, voices in an open and comfortable space. And we're also believing in a collective and collaborative process among students, parents, teachers, and admin. Again, this is through the committee that it will be formed. Um, and also a comfortable and positive learning environment for all. Again, we wanted to highlight the importance and appreciation of self-expression as well as maximizing campus safety. Um, thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, we're glad to be here at Watsonville High, and we will continue to show our pride in our school because there's a lot to be proud of. That was a great presentation. Thank you very, very much. Is a virtual academy here tonight? Come on up. We're so glad you're here. Press the button and turn on the mic. Well, good evening, Dr. Rodriguez, PVUSD Board of Education and Assistants, Superintendents. My name is Xavier Field, and I am a student at Virtual Academy. This is my second year attending Virtual Academy. Currently, 88% of Virtual Academy students have, have been enrolled at VA for two to three years. There is a high student participation rate at K-3 to three daily synchronous learning and grade 4 to 8 live interaction sessions. We have begun voluntary in-person collaboration activities this week at our school classroom. Students are excited to work on projects together for college and career week. Teachers are providing project, pro, project and our 6 to 12 assemblies will, our great 6 to 12 assemblies will have breakout sessions for students to select various college and career workshops to attend. What I like most about Virtual Academy is the people. Everyone is so friendly, helpful, and supportive, especially in situations where I may get overwhelmed and want to shut down. I learn best at Virtual Academy because I get to create my own schedule where I could set m my pace for each week. Having autism makes it difficult for me to really focus for long periods of time on schoolwork without feeling frustrated or overwhelmed. With the help of my mom and Miss Hines, I came up with a system that is best for me. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you, Xavier. Up is item 4.1, approval of an agenda. And to approve tonight's agenda. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Carries, thank you. Item, the next item is item 5.1, approval of board meeting minutes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Is it, that motion carries unanimously. Bill, is there is that microphone still on? Do you mind turning it off? Just so we don't get the feedback. <laughs> Thank you. Can I get a clarification on the approval of the board meeting minutes? Say the date. Those were the minutes for September 28, 2022. Uh, next up is item 6.1, their visitor non-agenda items. And the, 
Um, this is a time for public comment on things that are not on the agenda. And um, the public will have two minutes to make comments. Do we have any? Do we have six? So I'm, I'm going to be calling times. Um, if you could give me the. So we're going to start with Maria Bye. Bye. Ms. Ham. Members of the board and Dr. Rodriguez, my name is Marta Belay, and I presented in August regarding SABA's rezoning. On September 29th, there was a community meeting attended by hundreds of SABA students and parents who appeared to be prepped for the meeting for SABA by SABA school officials. I attended and noticed many unusual things, including Community Development Director Miriam served as a relatively insignificant source of information. She made no mention of staff's February 4th memo acknowledging that the Planning Commission lacked authority to issue a special use permit for SABA in 2013. Principal Ripp stated if the zoning request is denied, all SABA students will have to transfer schools at the end of the school year. His statement omitted protections afforded to charter schools in Proposition 13, which, as you know, benefited SABA in 2012. The meeting was focused on land use issues. However, it devolved into a diatribe against the Paro Valley Unified School District, with many SABA parents citing substandard education and safety. One parent and PVUSD employee expressed fear for her daughter surviving in a PVUSD classroom. Traffic engineers, city staff, and SABA have maintained that student drop-off and pickup traffic impact could be mitigated by a loop around the school. Said loop has never functioned as claimed because the site cannot accommodate drop-off and pick up for 525 students. Now SABA and the city appear to have approved new student drop-off and pickup locations, including along Highway 129, which goes from 25 to 45 miles per hour. When asked about the safety of this protocol, both City Traffic Coordinator Gonzalez and Principal Rip refused to answer the question. Instead, Gonzalez misstated the speed limit said it was in the state's jurisdiction and the city can't control where parents choose to drop off their kids. RIP maintained parents have the prerogative to use the state highway for student drop-off and pickup. Highway 129 is heavily trafficked by semis, tractors, and delivery vehicles, often exceeding speed limits. It is unsafe, and so is operating a school in an industrial zone. Here's a copy of staff's February 4th memo for your review. Thank you. Hello, I'm Liz Ham. I'm new to town. I'm looking forward to getting to know you. Uh, there's a new uh, lawsuit uh, with the Superior Court of the State of California, and uh, I just ran, wanted to read um, some of the general information uh, uh, regarding this here. Uh, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hand, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elected, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. That's from James Madison, the federal number 20, I'm sorry, number 51, 1788. If one branch attempts to exceed its constitutional powers, it is the judicial branch, the judicial branch's duty to stop the California Constitution provides that in-person instruction in public schools is a fundamental right. California Constitution, Article 9. The opportunity to attend and receive instruction in the public schools is a legal right that is enforceable by the same means as any other legal right. See Piper versus Big Pine School and Ward versus. Public education is also a fundamental right under the equal protection provision of the California Constitution. See Butt versus State of California, Serrano versus Priest, and Close versus Serrano, and Serrano. The California Constitution prohibits maintenance and operation of the public school system in a way that denies basic education equality to the students of particular districts. And I'm on it also. I'm old. Uh, school districts are not health officers and have no authority to issue or mandate health measures. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, I did. Yeah. So, um, so after Maryland, we have uh, Chris Webb, Rio Losa, and Juan Rocha. Marilyn Garrett, retired teacher from this district, and I say education, not radiation. Education, not toxic radiation from Wi-Fi, cell phones, cell towers, etc. And as I watch this pink breast cancer awareness month, microwave radiation and radiation causes cancer. There's a local doctor here who did a presentation, Health Impact of Wireless Radiation, and he showed a photo of a young woman who had breast cancer. The four points of the cancer were exactly where the four antennas of the phone were resting against her skin in her bra. Stop cancer where it starts. The district should not be promoting the toxic technology. And I'm going to give you an article again, and I've been talking to you about this for, what, decade since I retired in 2000, and you have not done anything to genuinely protect the children from this onslaught of radiation. This is called Time to Remove Wi-Fi from Our Schools by Mary Atkins, that's from 2011. She's with Citizens for Safe Technology. It states here, pulse modulated microwave radiation like that emitted by Wi-Fi has been demonstrated through thousands of published peer-reviewed scientific studies to cause headaches, which I have right now, migraines, concentration difficulties, hyperactivity, sleep disorders, memory loss, erratic heart rate, asthma, immune dysfunction, chronic illness, blood sugar fluctuations, muscle spasms, joint pains, behavior problems, anxiety, depression, skin rashes, you, night sweats, etc. I'll leave this with you. Maybe we wouldn't need so many special ed classes if we removed the Thank you. harm. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. Good evening. I want to express my profound gratitude to uh, Rich Arianos and, and whatever other PVUSD um, personnel are responsible for ensuring Renaissance students uh, got reusable water bottles. As a teacher, I really, I really appreciated this because it showed caring and responsiveness on the part of the district. It was direct aid to the students, and it's one more tiny way I can help keep my students in the room that much longer. Um, I hope one day that they'll be able to actually fill up that bottle from the drinking fountain in my room. So hopefully we can work on, on that at some point. Um, I also want to express my appreciation for district office personnel um, filling in uh, at Renaissance as our, as our, when, when we're without a principal. Um, the assistant superintendent of secondary especially impressed with her willingness to uh, engage with the students, like playing games with them and stuff at lunch. And also I had a colleague express appreciation for her um, because she was, she was being an, an authority, as you would expect of an admin. Um, and the reason this stood out is just because for, for a little while, a lot of the basic enforcement of norms has been come from teachers. So to have admin working with us in that way was really appreciated. So I want to thank that. I'm thankful for that. Um, and I, I, I thought I had heard that COVID leave was extended through the calendar year. So I, I, I would do want to appreciate that. Um, I think there might've been a couple days when it, we didn't have that. And, and to me, that's like a pretty serious thing. So I, I'd hope that nobody, no teacher who had a, an outage during that time got dinged on their days and and also i just like as a pvsd cares things i just don't always ensure that the district is going to have our back on that so thank you. uh good evening dr rodriguez and board members um my name is gio loza i'm from the transportation department 
I'm the admin assistant, and I'm here today to talk about a change in support that we need in our department. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys are aware that we had 16 vacancies available after our driver's bid, and we got about eight Michaels drivers, which still doesn't even cover um, the extra routes that we currently have. Uh, my drivers are currently doing double back, doing about two to extra routes on top of their own routes, so that is taking a toll on them. Uh, we have our 12-month employees also working um, routes, such as our trainers, fuelers, shop mechanics, dispatchers. Um, I've even gone out there to support um, our drivers and transport our special needs students in a white fleet vehicle just so they can go ahead and get to school and from school to home. So we're hoping that you guys can take into consideration um, reevaluating our department and see what the needs are and seeing what the community also needs. Um, possibly looking into the salary schedule and making it more attractive so we can retain drivers. Um, we currently did have two drivers leave our district, which was unfortunate, which makes us having um, two extra vacancies. I uh, also want to talk about um, how our fellow coworkers and staff members on other sites or even here at the district office speak to my drivers. I don't appreciate my drivers being talked to, um, talked down to, especially when they're already doing two, three extra runs, um, working 10 plus hours. It makes them feel like they're undermined and their work is not validated. Um, I hate receiving those calls, especially from school sites with teachers saying that, why are they late, um, that they need to rush on their route to get these students picked up and whatnot because it's cutting into their day. And that's something I really don't like answering phone calls in regards to because we're trying our best right here and what we're getting back from the community as well as our own um, coworkers is not making us feel validated. So I'm hoping that you guys could um, support us and see what we could do to make our department a better, well-rounded. Thank you. So after Juan Roche, we have um, Jesus Gonzalez, de la Vaz, Juan Martin. Hi, Dr. Rodriguez, and members of the board. Uh, it's nice to see the faces of the board here. And I've been recently uh, uh, worked. Uh, only a couple of years on the district, and I can see. And one of the reasons uh, the frustration of many of my coworkers and probably, as you heard, and probably will continue hearing, uh, the amount of work or the pressure that we are getting that we have to do double route, and um, where you feel the worst is when there gets uh, left us too because that route cannot cover and one of the questions that i could say is what the board is doing about it to get in more drivers uh to see who uh is uh, uh supporting our director and transportation as she's getting any support if she's coming out to you guys and ask for uh ways of getting more drivers and getting the retention on our drivers. I have heard as uh, uh, a recent employee, employee at the PVUSG, the rate or the chart, you know, where the starting rate is at, who is responsible of looking into that and what are we are doing, uh, who is uh, basically not doing what we're supposed to do for a retention, not only for drivers, but for any other position within our district. I have heard uh, many good comments in previous meetings that I have gladly got into it. And I think, Jennifer, you had hit really good points on it that I could remember, and it was uh, other mom, uh, members. So I hope that our team on transportation would get and see what you guys could help us out on Accommodating some of our necessities. Thank you. Question? Uh, uh, good evening, the board members and Dr. Rodriguez. Actually, thank you very much for having us here uh, in transportation. I've been here for 15 years, you know, and and we have remained silent for over a very long time here at Transplantation. You can feel, every time we go there in the morning, you can feel the 
but sometimes we have to put those tensions aside because we carry a very precious, very precious cargo. And some of you have loved ones. You guys have nieces, nephews, children. And as you know, we live in a big, big community. We carry Santa Cruz County. We carry Monterey County. And as a father, we also carry that responsibility working for PVUSD. And right now, we're short drivers. You know, we see the shortness. We see the mechanics. They're doing their best. And they're driving each day. And that's a safety issue. Because these buses are, it's like, you know, oil and all that. These buses are breaking down, and we have to deal with that. And we have to look at our gauges, and we have to pay attention to our students. They don't get hurt in the bus. And making sure that they're sitting down. And some of you, like I said, have grandchildren. And our number one is our safety, you know, of each student. And it breaks my heart when children can't get home because the driver shortage or, you know, sometimes we have to cover these field trips. And we have to pick up the slack. We can't just leave the children behind. We, 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 we always talk about, you know, being a family and leaving no children behind. And it just breaks my heart because this could be one of your children. This could be one of your nieces there waiting to get home safe to their family and their loved ones. So I just ask you, please consider thinking about their safety, the children. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate it. Good evening, board members. I am here to voice our concerns in transportation. We find ourselves in need of a raise. The cost of living is going off the roof, but our salary is still the same. There are other school districts that are starting at $25 for bus drivers when we start at 17. We are doubling route to get our kids safe to school and to, to our houses. This is a time for you guys. This is a time to act. That this is a time to act. The school district needs to take care of our transportation. We're losing our drivers. Um, we just we just had two drivers leaving. Um, they're getting double the pay we are getting right now. Also, for like for us, for Wednesdays, for the ones we that we do after school. Um, we would like it to, instead of, because they come out at 6, would like to have them come out a little bit earlier, like we used to have it before. So we could also have, like, time to our, for our kids, because I have three kids. Sometimes I get out at 8. I'm, I'm in the yard at 5.30, get out um the yard at 8. I get home at 8.30 for my kids. And also, like, if we could get like a like a split shift stipend, because we can't get another job, we could only work sixteen hours a day, but we can't like try to get a, a work like on the site because no one's gonna want to hire us for two hours or three, because we have like split shifts, so no one's gonna want to like give us a job for two hours or anything like that. So one, we're going to have Mary Gavin Doja. Uh, good evening, board. Um, I am Johnny Martinez, or one of my. Um, I'm here representing the. We are not allowed. We have regulation, not just, but actually. If you want to know more about that, our drivers are not allowed to work in eight. They have eight hours and six before they 
So yeah, they can go and get another. They're working from 5.30. But they're only getting paid for Do the math. 16 hours out there, that's California law counting against them. And they're only getting paid. So yes, maybe the split shift would actually Cost of living is our neighbor's district, Vista, two of our drivers. They went from $20 an hour to $20 an hour. So what does that impact have to the rest of my 40 drivers? There's other better, better districts that are paying double the same. So, yeah. Getting a second job, really not an option. Unless um, California law. I don't mind. There's garbage people out there that get paid more. They're picking up garbage. Is garbage more important than students? Is garbage more valuable than our children? What kind of message is that? So, transportation department is one of the biggest departments in the school district, and that department is bleeding. And we're starting to lose drivers, but I feel like it's time for us to act and really appreciate it. and our drivers. Thank you. Have Mary. Yeah. Good evening, board. I'm not prepared at all, but um, I'm just here to support my fellow workers and everything that they're saying tonight because I I believe that a change is due. We are depleting the department, and I think we all are aware of it. We make twenty-one eighty-eight, twenty-one dollars and eighty-eight cents, and it's been on. And then we start at seventeen. So can you imagine the new workers that come in? They come in at 17. They have to be here, what, five years to come up to the top at $21 with 88 cents. Yeah, two of our drivers left. They were here for 15 year plus. We lost them for, for a higher pay, $40. They do make double. And like I said, I'm, I'm going to retire in a year because the more I'm here, with the transportation, the more I know and the more I see, it's kind of, it's unfortunate. And it's unfortunate for, for us that the majority are Latinos, and we don't even get a stipend. And the majority of the people that, the students that we pick, pick up, the students, are Latinos, except for the um, South, um, North Zone. But we don't even get offered a stipend. And that's unfortunate as well. Um, but like I said, I'm here to support our, my fellow workers, the transportation department. I like my job. I really do. I've been here 15 years. Do I really need this job? Yes, but I have a second, a second income. And not everybody else does. I'm fortunate. Because my parents were hard workers. They were labor workers. They're not here with me anymore. But they work their butts off. To have a better life for me. So this income that I make for transportation is the second income for me. And not everybody has that opportunity like Maristela was saying. But I appreciate you all and I still would support PBUSD. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Dr. Rodriguez and board meeting. I'm very nervous because I never talk in public, so I think I talk in Spanish because my English, I forgot. That's fine, it's not waving. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to... Vente, my friend. <laughs> um, I'm in the same, in the same role with, with her. Estoy en el mismo... <laughs> it's okay. Estoy en el mismo you, you, you need me to hold your oh, shoulder no, it's okay. and you can do the English, it's fine too. <laughs> I'm in the same role as they are. 
We need, necesitamos uh, sobrevivir. We need to survive in this días. hard time that we just were facing. Algunos de nosotros lo podemos Some of us are able to do it because we have the help of our children. Pero hay But there's a lot that they don't have that. The other thing is we all come, we're all here every day to work. No sabemos cómo va a ser. We're not sure how the day is going to go. Esperamos que esté tranquilo, pero mayor de, mayor de las veces es difícil. We're hoping for a, a good day, but the majority of the days are not like that. As soon as we walk in, we have to cover about 20 routes, so many different routes. The other thing is the buses are not working. I've actually experienced um, my bus um, being without brake on the road. Gracias a Dios que no traía nadie. Thank God I was I didn't have anybody with me. It was just me by myself. Yeah. And I was just I had just gotten off the freeway. So thank God everything was okay. Pero necesitamos más bases nuevas y necesitamos donde apoyo so we need uh, better buses newer buses and we also need your support como estamos no because the way things are right now we just cannot go on we cannot continue this way We have Sean, Doggin, Pam Sexton, and Sherry. Good evening. My name is Luis. Uh, like my, my co workers were saying, uh, transportation is bleeding. Just there's a lot to, a lot, it's a lot going on, especially for the floaters. I'm going to talk a little bit about the floaters, even though I'm not a floater right now. But they go through a lot because um, some of them are there since four, five thirty in the morning, and like some of the my coworkers were saying, they end their shifts close to seven, maybe if they do after school. Uh, there's buses breaking down left and right, uh, like they say as they were saying as well. Mechanics are working, uh, fuelers are working, um, driving. I mean, uh, sometimes there is buses that I feel they. They don't have the proper attention to get fixed properly because in occasions there's been uh, mechanics uh, that semi, semi kind of fix the problem, but it's still not drivable because they actually either have to send them away to actually get fixed. And then there's more money spending on them that the mechanics should have. If they're getting good paid, they should know what they're doing and not have it, not have them send uh, somewhere else. Uh, another thing, like I said, uh, getting a raise, our salary is like 2188 again, and there's other districts out there as well. Like they start at 28. There's some districts that start at 28. Uh, they top at 35, 32, depending, um, uh, waste management as well. I have a lot of buddies that work there. Um, they, they top at, a, they top off at 40. Uh, they, and if you have experience, they'll pay you at 37 starting. And a lot of them, I think we are going to still keep on losing a lot of drivers because we're drowning pretty much. Like cost of living is, is really, it's really up there. I'm a single father of three. And, all right. Sean, Pam, and Hi, my name is Sean. I'm a dispatcher in transportation. And once again, I'm here to back up my fellow bus drivers and the office staff. I agree, our 
our department is totally understaffed. Our drivers fight constantly going out, deciding, do I do a field and leave my students uh, getting home because I'm doing a field? Do I work a route and then do two routes and do those field trips not get covered? There's just not enough people to go around and do the work that we need to do. And then the school site calling you, where's the bus? Where's the bus? Why is it my bus? The parents saying, how come my why is it? And we're just apologizing. Tonight, here's another example. We didn't have after school. We had drivers doing two and three after school. Parents calling. We reassured them. They were all grateful their kids were coming home. But yes, everything ran because we didn't have drivers to drive. And I understand. Everybody needs a life. A, everybody's stagnant. We're all maxed out. Nobody's getting raises. It needs to be reevaluated. I also have a daughter that works for the school district is, who's underpaid also. You know, we're all underpaid. We think. We all, we're all working to make a living. And the cost of living is common. We all enjoy what we're doing, but um, we just need more. And transportation is ground. Just completely ground. And I don't know what to do. And we're pleading, please get more. Hi, I'm Pam Sexton. I'm a teacher in adult ed. And I want to start by um, giving my gratitude and solidarity with the transportation workers. Um, you, keep, you keep the system going. Um, thank you so much. And I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to share, because I'm not sure um, if you've been able to visit our adult education classes. Um, but, so I, I just want to remind everyone about adult education, because it's so wonderful. I wanted to let you know, I wanted to just tell you, in my class, I'm teaching ESL three levels, beginning levels. I have students from age 18 to age 82. And such a beautiful community feel. Our, um, our school really helps our school district to serve the full community. A lot of my students are parents, grandparents, um, you know, uh, related in various ways to students in the K-12. And so just to remind you of that, and what am I forgetting? Um, I, it, so I, I also want um, to let you know that the shortage of teachers is also an issue now in adult ed, and it impacts our students, our teachers, our school, and our community. Um, we have a GED and Espanol class, which needs another teacher. Um, our ESL classes um, were short on teachers. And I, the last thing I guess I want to say is um, with what well, I saw in the agenda, and I know this is not agenda, but the MOU with the Senior Center, these collaborations are awesome. Yeah, um, I'm sure you're going to sign off on that, but it's wonderful. And the Esperanza Community Farm um, is another example of an awesome collaboration. Thank you. Mary, we'll um, call Donna. So last spring, there was a hospital in Cleveland where my uh, cousin, a uh, nurse practitioner, and uh, they went into what's called a mass casualty protocol. Um, every single medically qualified employee left their assigned floors, shoot offices, in the comfort of their bubbles. And they went straight down to the emergency room. And they provided care to the gunshot victim that the ambulance was bringing in. Some of those people had not been in an emergency room in over 10 years had 
pretty much been doing the paper pushing stuff, but because the protocol had to keep their license stuff like that up to date. They all followed the protocol. Because my, as my cousin told me, he said, at the end of the day, we serve patients. That's our number one priority. So I was relaying the story to my son, who is an attorney in the United States Air Force. And he told me, this is the norm, Mom. When there's a crisis, everyone on deck. Everybody. He is interning. He's a terrible guy. But if he has to, goes on, he has to go on the field. I mean, obviously he hasn't. We don't really have a shortage of military people, people signing up. Um, but we do have a medical personnel shortage. We do have an education teacher shortage. Okay? But the thing is, is at the end of the day, who do we serve? We have 30 people, at least, in the tower with credentials. Put them in a classroom full time so those kids have a teacher of record. Not once a week, oh, I got this school, oh, I got this school. I'm hearing them. Put them in a classroom. You serve students first. I don't care how great your PDs are. I'm not doing them if I don't have time. Your first job is that. And by the way, I make. I make more than that in my part-time job. That's pathetic. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Donna LaFever. I'm a math teacher at Watsonville High School. Um, <clears throat> so uh, our staff are being overworked at Watsonville High School quite a lot. Um, also within the district, huge problem. Um, Dr. Rodriguez came to our site uh, last week for conversations with the superintendent. And when she left, the comments from the staff was, well, I guess the district doesn't care about Watsonville High School. You need to show that you care by ensuring that we have the resources to meet the needs of our kids. So you need to do that by paying our bus drivers more. You need to pay our custodial staff more. You need to pay substitutes more. You need to pay the people that are doing the work more. And you need to step into the roles that are vacant right now. We need that to happen right now. I'm going to transition a little bit into math because that's my profession. And today in our math department meeting, the same sentiment. The district doesn't care about Watsonville High School. That was echoed in our math department meeting today. During your presentation, you discussed the difference between equality and equity. And equality being same resources going out to everyone, but equity meaning recognizing that people have different circumstances and we need to allocate resources differently to make sure that the op opportunities and resources that are available to all of our students have the, um, are able to reach the same outcome. That's what we're trying to shoot for. And so in order to have that happen, we need more support for these kids in the class. And when I said that we need to get our class sizes down to 20 to 1, you laugh. That can't be a laughing thing. You can't think that that's just some pipe dream. We need that. That's what we need. And so we need a leader who's going to find creative solutions to address these problems, and we need it right now. Thank you. Next up, we have um, item 7.1, PVFP, the Pajaro Valley Federation of Section is for employee organization comments. Good evening, Board of Trustees, President DeSerpa, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, there are plenty of agenda items that bear addressing tonight, such as the resolutions presented to the board. We would like to acknowledge especially the board for bringing forward 8.3 to approve October as LGBTQ plus history month, as well as 8.6 in support of Prop 28 to bring VAPA back into our schools permanently. 
Um, but what I would like to speak to is actually not on tonight's agenda. And I want to thank Trustee Shocker for acknowledging in her comments the extra work that our members are performing daily, regularly, all of the time. Um, the loss of prep, the continued vacancies, and the additional mandates that have been added are all causing an undue burden on every single site, every single educator, every single support staff, as we've heard, and every single student. Um, this has been brought forward by our members. This has been brought forward by our President Nelly. This has been brought forward by myself. This has been brought forward by our brothers and sisters in CSEA. It's no news. Um, everybody is talking about a shortage. There's an educator shortage. There's a special ed shortage. There's a paraprofessional shortage. I refuse to call it a shortage. There are plenty of qualified professionals out there. They just refuse to work in these conditions. They refuse to work in conditions where they are not valued, they are not respected, they are micromanaged, and they cannot provide a living wage for themselves or their families. We talk about the whole child, the whole family, the whole community. We are the community. Unless you are collaborating with us, unless you are collaborating with our brothers and sisters in CSEA, we are not providing for the whole community. Some of the things that have come forward, and I want to tell you, we have a curriculum council where the exact purpose is to collaborate with the district on bringing these items forward. But we have Dibbles now. We have Sewn to Grow. We have PBIS. We have MTSS. We have numerous other programs that have been mandated on our staff that have not come through curriculum council, that have not ever been talked to about to the people that it impacts, to the workload of the people that it impacts. I, I want to welcome you all as trustees to spend a day in the life, to come to see what it's like to schedule every single detail that, that our educators have to schedule into their minute time with students and make it count because it's impossible. It is literally impossible. And I also just want to acknowledge our brothers and sisters in CSEA, and, and as you heard from their transportation department tonight, it affects all of us. When we don't have students showing up to school on time, it affects the students, the families, the teachers, the site. It is a whole community, and we need to address it as such. Thank you. The next Thank you. Madam President, Dr. Rodriguez, trustees, staff. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you about the best kept secret in Watsonville. The teachers and classified workers got a 12% increase over the last 10 years, and nobody knows about it. It came from the increase in contribution to CalSTRS and CalPERS that the district covered. In 2010, to give you some history, CalSTRS and CalPERS were going broke. They were only 50% funded, and G Governor Brown stepped in and said, hey, we've got to increase the contribution. And that has moved up almost every year and is continuing to go up. And that was to avoid bankruptcy which meant all the retirement money for our teachers and our uh, workers would be gone. So why was this needed? The funds were paying out more than they were taking in. Their promised return was 7.8%. They never met that in over 10 years. It's still the case today. It's one of the worst managed funds in the United States. My grandsons are doing better than they are. Most returns on funds that you invest, get 8% on average. Well, recently, CalSTRS and CalPERS, they're running 3%. They should be fired. And why aren't the unions protesting in Sacramento? Because it's taking money out of the budget to cover their retirement fund that could be used for pay. 12%, that'd be a big deal. So 
why are we seeing PVFD and the uh, CSCA complaining about PVUSD being cold hearted when the real problem is poor management of the retirement fund, which is sucking money out of our budget so they can't get their pay raise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item 7.2 is CSEA, our Board of Trustees, Michelle, Cabinet. So, just really quick. I'll be oh, I'm real quick. I'm going to make it real quick. Okay. All I got to say is, wow. It's been interesting tonight hearing everybody. Very interesting. Um, I, I'm very proud of transportation for stepping up. It's been a long time. I've been hearing a lot of things, and they finally moved forward. Good for them. Very proud of them. Anyone here? Transportation? Well, well, there you are. There you are. No, you're good. You can stand right next to me. So, here's the thing. You heard their concerns. You heard what's going on. You hear how bad it is. As much as, you know, us working with the district, our negotiations are moving forward. Things are looking good, but they're not quite there yet. We got a lot of improvement. We got a lot of things to reconsider and look at. We need to do our best for the people, for our students. If everybody's happy, there is no excuses. But the problem is, nobody's happy. Everybody's pretty upset. Everybody's struggling. And if I can't eat, you can't eat. And that's the way we're looking at things right now. We need to focus. We need to be together and do things together. If you want to sit at my table, my table, you need to pitch in. And that's how it is. This is my backyard. If you're not invited, you're going to hear a lot of, oh, I can't say that. But there's a lot of improvement that needs to happen here. And I hope you guys heard what happened today, heard what's the concerns, and please adjust and address. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. A 7.3. Bajaro. Good evening, President Sherpa, Board of Trustees, Mr. Rodriguez, and the um, My name is Lisa Sandoval, and I'm the Director of Child Development. I'm here to share an update of some of the happenings in our program. Currently, we are still enrolling students in TK, State Preschool, and Family Child. We have a few more TK slots that we're working on. We also have 70 State Preschool slots that we are currently filling and approximately 100 family child slots. Unfortunately, we have more families on our wait list than slots and understand the needs of our community, so we are continually looking for ways to expand. Our seasonal are we also were able to just recently um, work to support as much PBUSD staff that we're able to. And so just recently, we have been able to offer full-time child care services to the staff members who met eligibility requirements for the program. Our seasonal zero to five child care center located at Buena Vista Camp will be closing on October 31st. We recognize that not all families will be leaving our area. Therefore, we have been supporting those families to find placement in our other programs so they can have a continued our team parent coordinator, for you who don't know, we oversee the team parent program, Gande Nunes has been actively meeting with our pregnant and parenting students across their team. She's been working to support the students, their, their child, the child, and family, as well as the school site and teachers as appropriate. 
This is her second year and she's been doing a phenomenal job connecting with our students and helping them to stay in school as well as on the hardest task of being a parent. We are a zero to five program. And over the last couple of years, we've seen a need to support our youngest children and an increase of accepting children in their late twos, their early threes, enroll in our state preschool program. Therefore, our team parent coordinator and our family child care home slash state preschool coordinator were chosen and have been accepted to become trainers for the PIC program for infant and toddler care program. So they be able to offer trainings to not only our teachers and to the community, which is a great need for only a couple other trainers in the so for those of you who also don't know, Child Development Department oversees the Singer Reader Program. This program provides a weekly read book bag with three books, goes home with the child for a week, and then comes back. They can read with their families, talk about the book. We meet with the parents. Our last parent meetings were about the Raising a Reader Program and uh, improve and increase literacy skills that possibly possible. Not only programs serve our most of our ECE programs, it also serves schools throughout the county. Currently, we have approximately 2,800 students. I'm excited to announce that our mental health clinicians, Maria Reina Rincon and Brenda Renteria, along with our coordinator, Linda Roscoe, are offering monthly early learning community via Zoom. This is open to anybody. A few of the upcoming topics are caregiver wellness, mental health, and culture and diversity. As I said, they're open to everybody, including parents, caregivers, and educators. Plus, when ECE educators attend, they're able to receive a certificate for their professional growth hours when they renew their permit. Lastly, our district has many ECE programs, and navigating them can sometimes be difficult. So we have worked collaboratively on a one-page document with all the programs on one side and eligibility requirements on the other. It is available in English and Spanish and has been sent to all our PVUSD schools, and we are continuing with distribution in other locations for Thank you for your time and the programs in child. Thank you. Item 7.4, Members of America, who present our Moving on to items. Approve a resolution 2318, 20, a month of October as inheritance. Yeah, thank you so much. So we have several really important resolutions that are, we're having tonight. The first one is um, for, as was noted, the month of October as the Italian Heritage Month. So. I do want to um, thank Trustee Dodge Jr. for encouraging us to do this resolution and also for um, Jamie um, Leonardovich, who is the president of the Watsonville Sons and Daughters of Italy in American America Le um, Lodge um, 2016. And so I know that Jamie wanted to be able to speak. So be able to on up. You can also bring anyone that you have with you. You can bring as well. Superintendent, thank you. Board of Trustees, thank you. Staff, thank you for the recognition. And we have something we would like to read. It's something that um, our Sons and Daughters of Italy post every month on the back of their newsletter that comes to us from the Grand Lodge. I am an Italian American. My roots are deep in an ancient soil, drenched by the Mediterranean sun and watered by pure streams from snow capped mountains. Excuse me. <clears throat> I am enriched by thousands of years of culture. My hands are those of the Mesa, the artist and the man of the soil. My thoughts have been recorded in the annals of Rome, the poetry of Virgil, the creations of Dante, and the philosophy of Benedict 
Benedetto Croce. I am an Italian American, and from my ancient world, I first spanned the seas of the New World. I am Cristofo Colombo. I am Giovanni Caboto, known in American history as John Cabot, discoverer of the mainland of North America. I am Emergio Vuspici, Bus, Bus, <laughs> sorry, who gave my name to the New World, America. First to sail on the Great Lakes in 1679, founder of the territory that became the state of Illinois, colonizer of Louisiana and Arkansas. I am Enrico Ponti. I am Filippo Mazzi, friend of Thomas Jefferson, and my thesis on the equity of man was written into the Bill of Rights. I am William Paca, signer of the Declaration of Independence. I am an Italian American. I financed the Northwest Expedition of George Rogers Clark and accompanied him through the lands that would become Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan. I am Colonel Francesco Virgo. I mapped the Pacific from Mexico to Alaska into the Philippines. I am Alessandro Malaspina. I am. I don't have my reading glasses tonight, sorry. Giacomo Balatrimi, discoverer of the source of the Mississippi River, River in 1823. I created the Dome of the United States Capitol. They called me the Michelangelo of America. I am Constantino Brumidi. In 1904, I founded the San Francisco, I founded in San Francisco the Bank of Italy, now known as the Bank of America, the largest financial institution in the world. I am A.P. Giannini. I am Enrico Fermi, father of nuclear science in America, first enlisted man, enlisted man to win the Medal of Honor in World War II. I am John Bassolone of New Jersey. I am an Italian American. I am the million strong who served in America's armies and the tens of thousands whose names are enshrined in military cemeteries. From Guadalcanal to the Rhine, I am the steelmaker in Pittsburgh, the grower in the Imperial Valley of California, the textile designer in Manhattan, the movie maker in Hollywood and homemaker, and the breadwinner in 10,000 communities. I am an American without stint or reservation, loving this land as only one who understands history, its agonies, and its triumphs can love it and serve it. I will not be told that my contribution is any less, nor make role not make my role not as worthy as that of any other American. I will stand in support of this nation's freedom and promise against all foes. My heritage has dedicated me to this nation. I am proud of my full heritage, and I shall remain worthy of it. I am an Italian American. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting scholarships and all that you do in the community with your organization. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you for recognizing the Italian American. Thank you. Annette. Sorry, we need a motion to approve. I was going to make a motion. I just had it. A Comment. Um, yeah. I wanted to um, reiterate what you just said, President Serpa, um, with regards to what sons and da um, daughters of Italy have done for decades and decades in our community, for our youth and our children, for your scholarships and just so many other things. Thank you so much. And you've made college a real possibility and given that hope and that drive and desire to so many. So thank you. And with that, I make my motion to approve resolution. 22, 23, 18, month of October as Italian Heritage Month for School District. Yeah, I, I second that and I also have a comment. Uh, I grew up in the Slains Valley uh, at the Giannini Ranch right there on uh, Espinosa Road, John Giannini, Dirk Giannini. Um, I learned a lot living there on the farm. Um, about farming, about cattle ranching, and the one particular thing that I took from them was how to eat lunch. 
You know, they don't make sandwiches. Everything's by the bite. And I have a great appreciation for Salametti now. And I have a hard time finding it, but I found it at Zoccoli's now in, in uh, Santa Cruz. But, uh, yeah, so thank you, and thank you, John Giannini and Dirk Giannini. Uh, I still keep in touch with Dirk. He's, he's a pretty active farmer out in the Salinas Valley, and uh, it's, it's a good, uh, interesting uh, upbringing that I had, you know, being around them. So thank you. Are there any? Oh, another. Uh, I would just like to thank you, Council Member Elect Clark, for helping me put this together. Um, you know, I haven't known you that long, but I know you, me, you share um, districts. You know, you are a council member in my district, and um, I look I look forward to working with you to improve our road. You know, I, um, there's some roads in your area. In my area, that we need, you know, we need, we need to fix them. And I know you will be an advocate to make sure we can fix the road, uh, install street lights, and we need to find ways to work together to make sure people slow down around parks and schools. And I look forward to working with you on that. Um, I also like to thank uh, Janie Letternit for for making this happen. You know, I haven't personally met you one on one, but um, I know you're an important person in our community, Pajaro Valley. And I wanted to make sure that we get this language for the people of the Pajaro Valley. Um, I, I think we're all in this together. You know, I, I believe in just being, you know, being different races, different heritages, but we all have one common cause, and that's to make this place a better place. And um, thank you to the Watsonville Sons and Daughters of Italy. Just like you know, some of my trustees says, you guys do a lot of work, raise a lot of money, and you put it back for our children. Um, I represent Wapapal High, and I see your guys' organization name all the time. I just wanted to say thank you very much for helping everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a first and a second? In favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. M8.2, approval of a mural at Cesar Chavez Middle School. Uh, good evening, President of Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Dariano, the Director of Purchasing, and here to co present with me tonight, um, Rhonda, who will uh, be able to speak to the design and concept behind the proposed mural for Chavez Middle School. Um, just a little bit of background for my piece. As you can see, um, the location is, is noted on this map. It's, I believe, the south-facing wall of the cafeteria building at Chavez, so it'll be very visible when you um, come into the school, into the, into the roundabout, and right adjacent to the um, cafeteria. And then we have a um, sketch in color of the proposed mural. It will be applied uh, directly to the building, and this was something that Yermo and I had discussed. I had also discussed with our facilities team. It is the preference of both of us that go directly on the building. And um, yeah, the proposed fee for the mural is $18,621. And I would love to give Yermo a moment to discuss kind of the background of how this came together. I came just to see if there was any questions I could answer that. Richard Quinn. Uh, I've been I've been working last year. I've been working with the uh, student uh, Mrs. Soratello uh, class going in regularly on Wednesdays and uh, developed this concept based uh, uh, on the life and history of Cesar Chavez, also including our relatives from this area. Only. Uh, I don't know if there's any particular questions you might have regarding it. Uh, I prefer going right onto a stucco wall. We talked about panels. Uh, we uh, panels, what I've seen in the past, uh, create a lot of problems. You begin to have dry rot. It's a uh, higher expense and higher maintenance, and they don't last. They've been a headache, actually. Um, 
if there's any questions in particular, I'd be more than glad to answer them. Have no speakers to this. Comments, Jen D. Holm has a question. I wanted to, you know, sure that we wanted after the previous calls, we wanted to really make. But I'll defer to the artist that on the walls. Yeah. That's what I would recommend. Any other questions? I just have a comment. Yes. Uh, Fifteen years ago, you worked with me at uh, Valencia. Yes. I don't know if I you remember. Think. Yes. And every single kid in that school got a paintbrush with and mm -hmm. paint. Even the kids in wheelchair wanted that. And it was especially, um, especially grateful for your advice so mm -hmm. that they speak in their own language to you about what you instruct. Beautiful. I and enjoyed so, it. I enjoyed it. I remember it. Yeah. A lot of Thank you. D Shop. So I'm excited for this. Um, I know that the children at Cesar Chavez are very excited. And I've been out to see the proposed wall that you are talking about, and I think it is going to be a wonderful piece of art that we can preserve <laughs> throughout the years for our community, and th these kids will never forget their experience that they're going to have with you leading them in the mural. And, um, you know, you said putting it on the stucco, because that's also easier to maintain, correct? So you yes. can do touch-ups as needed. Yeah. On that. Okay. So I just want to say thank you very much yes. for taking on this project. Um, thank you. And I'd also like to make a motion to approve, but I think Rusty Dodge has. I just wanted to say uh, thank you, Guillermo Aranda, for all the murals that you've done at the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Mm -hmm. um, I also just want to publicly apologize for what happened to your mural at Wants of Ohio. Uh, I believe that kind of fell under my responsibility, and so I just wanted to publicly apologize for letting that happen, because that's a, a historical piece for the people of Watsonville. Yeah. You know, generations before me painted and were part of that, so I just wanted to say that first of all, but uh, you know, I support your murals. Your, your murals last decade and lifetimes. Um, I, I know uh, I used to know it as La Manzana Center, but I'm not sure it's changed now. But, um, you know, your work there, your work that used to be at Salud para la Gente, um, it, it lasts forever, mm -hmm. and hopefully this lasts forever. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. As far as um, getting kids involved, what out of this girl uh, would What part? Yeah, of the mural, uh, incorporates the feedback. Uh, just about all of it. Uh, the workers, the marches, the flags, um, and I believe that they, with Mrs. Soterello, I get her mixed name a little, uh, but they've did a lot of research, even between the times that I was there. So quite a bit of it. Uh, I uh, I think I I lean I contributed more on the left section that dealt with the Ohlone, the the native people of this area, and of course. Combined it, put brought the images together. That you know, that's my part. Um, it's great, and I think, um, the note there. Fire volumes too. Important that is to just feel represented within the and still uh, being open to learning about other cultures. Um, the uh, carry on. So, um, 
Thank you for bringing this. Papers. And all those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't want to disrupt for a second. Saying that. Um, so I'm not sure if we should need to direct this to or to involve Dr. Rodriguez. Um, because uh, to, to Trustees Holmes' point, it's you know what after we went through at Watsonville High School and Renaissance High School, we don't want to see that issue repeat. You know, decades from now. Um, you know, when other people are here and bestow that upon them because we said we wanted to take serious strides to ensure that that doesn't. So is there a way you could explain how that's going? I mean, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but <laughs> tell um, me what's going to happen 30 years from now. No. I'll probably I, defer to Dr. Rodriguez, but my understanding was the murals will need to be approved to be applied and they'll also need to be approved to be removed. It would always come to the board before any action was taken to alter or remove any part. That's great. So after the issue that happened at Watsonville High School, then we worked with Mr. Aranda to help us look at that policy, and we developed a policy that mirrored after San, um, San Francisco Unified. And so now, which is the why, why it came forward for Ren. Right? That's so, where I was going with it, I mean, I know what we did to say about what we were going to do, but then we had the issue at Renaissance, so I just want no, to ensure. We, we didn't have an issue at Renaissance. We brought the, the issue, fo we brought the action item forward, and then at that point is when the board decided we, we had the action item about the removal of them. Correct. And there was a lot of concerns and outcry for that. That's part of it, I'm calling. So I just don't want to see that we bestow hardships upon future members of our community and future board members with this decision. And I'm just not sure how that's going to happen, but, but that was just my clarification. I'm totally supportive of it. I just yeah. don't want to have a public outcry from now. Yeah, I, I assume that uh, we're talking about the board being concerned about liabilities. Should a building be destroyed? There's a mural on it. There's the... Uh, what they call the Vera Act, uh, Visual Artist uh, Rights Act, which uh, protects not only the building owners but the artists. And basically, it's a, it's a system set up of communication, informing the artists uh, the, uh, at least 90 days prior to any destruction, removal, anything that might affect the the mural, alteration, whatever it might be. Uh, the building owner, the company, whatever, uh, with proper notification, uh, removes itself from any liability. Uh, basically, it's just telling the artist, 90 days ahead of time, we're going to, this building is going to be demolished or something's going to happen that's going to alter your work. Um, then it's up to the artist to either document the work that he's done, find a way of removing it, and it's something that is possible, it can be done, or maybe uh, halt the destruction if there's a way. But there's a process, and I think basically uh, it's just being familiar with that. Vera, there's also Kappa, California Restoration Act. So there's a couple of different uh, laws, legislation that protect uh, not only the artists, but makes it very clear. And, and I feel also protect the building owner or the, the people in commissioning the mural. Thank you so much for that clarification. That really helps shed light on it for me. Thank you. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for your work. <laughs> Item 8.3 approve resolution 22 October as held. 
evening. Good evening, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, and Pajaro Valley community. Um, it's my honor to present this resolution, and I'll have some people come up and join me in a moment to, to read it. October is National LGBTQ Plus History Month. In 1994, Rodney Wilson, a Missouri high school teacher, believed a month should be dedicated to the celebration and teaching of gay and lesbian history and gathered other teachers and community leaders to support. They selected October because public schools are in session and existing LGBTQ plus traditions, such as coming out day, which was yesterday, also occur that month. Um, also in that month um, in PBUSD, we, we fly the progress flag in the school. Um, and since that time, uh, the month of October has been endorsed, endorsed by GLAAD, the Human Rights Campaign, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, the National Education Association, and other national organizations. This evening, before the board, is a resolution proclaiming October as LGBTQ plus History Month. And I would like to invite some folks up from PBUSD students and staff to help read the resolution. Um, oh, wouldn't mind. You can pull down the mic. My name is Aaron Gonzalez, and I go to Wattsville High School. I'm Jenny Gutierrez, and I'm from Watsonville High School. Hi again, my name is Morielle Mamoril. Um, I'm part of Watsonville High School Saga Club, Sexuality and Gender Acceptance. Yeah. And shout out to Mr. Pels, our club advisor. He's awesome. <laughs> hey again, I'm Selena Salvador. I'm also with Saga, the Saga Club. Hi, I'm Katie Chris Kunis, assistant principal at Aptos High School and member of the PVUSD LGBTQ plus task force. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Slider, coordinator of student services. Hello, I'm Jen Salinas Holtz. I'm a USD parent and advisor for GSA clubs and part of the LGBTQ task force. Uh, earlier, my name is Chrissy McLean. I'm the coordinator of counseling programs here for PBUSD, and um, I help lead the LGBTQ plus task force for PBUSD. Without further ado, we're going to begin reading the resolution. Not every single part, but um, we all have some parts. Thank you for the honor. Whereas LGBTQ plus History Month is an annual month-long observ observance of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender history, and the history of the gay rights and related civil rights movements, which was founded in 1994 by Missouri high school history teacher Rodney Wilson and Whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Education believes that the rich variety and diversity of families and communities is one of our strengths, and furthermore believes that a strong community consists of a supportive unit composed of various genders, orientations, cultures, races and ethnicity and ethnicities and whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Education values, honors, and welcomes the diversity of our student body, our teachers, our staff, and administrators, including the diversity of sexual orientation and identity in our community. And Whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Education recognizes that we have students and staff at all grade levels and when within the organization that are LGBTQ plus and or have LGBTQ plus family members and they deserve to feel recognized and valued and. Whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District has through our resolutions and our actions made a commitment to achieving acceptance through fostering diversity and inclusion in our staff, our school population, and in our curriculum, and. Whereas on July 14, 2011, the Fair, Accurate, Inclusive, and Respectful Fair Education Act was passed and signed into law in California and mandates the inclusion of the political, economic, and social contributions of lesbian, gay, 
bisexual and transgender people in the social studies and history curricula in California public schools, and whereas on July 14, 2016, the California State Board of Education passed a new history social science framework that includes LGBTQ plus American history content to be taught in K through 12 classrooms, and whereas the Pajaro Valley Unified School District recognizes the important contributions of local state and national LGBTQ plus people to the history of the United States by promoting social justice, enhancing health and well-being, and building a sense of community for LGBTQ plus people, and Whereas LGBTQ plus individuals continue to make noteworthy and important contributions that have led and will continue to have great impact on our history, culture, and society, and whereas the Pajaro Valley Unified School District supports the rights, freedoms, and equality of those who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, pansexual, and asexual, LGBTQ+, plus, and Whereas the Pajaro Valley Unified School District affirms its role in and commitment to continuing the historical process of transforming the educational system to ensure inclusiveness, safety, and a sense of belonging for all LGBTQ plus students, teachers, staff, and their families, and Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Education celebrates the accomplishments of LGBTQ plus people in history, encourages all schools to celebrate October as LGBTQ plus History Month, and encourages teachers to teach about lessons, the, to teach lessons about LGBTQ plus history in their classrooms aligned with the state history framework, not just in October, but all year long. We respectfully request or hope that you will be approving this resolution. Do you have any speakers to this issue? We have Pam Sen, followed by Paul. I just want to strongly support this um, resolution, and and I love that how it ends with not just in October, but all year long. Um, and I, with that, I also wanted to to say that, um, you know, it's great having the pride flag up certain days, certain months, but it would be great to have it all the time. The, oh, I forgot my, um, shoot, I had just gotten on my phone the stats, you know, I think <laughs> the stats, it, but you probably know the statistics are horrific about um, suicide, um, self-harm, and we need our schools to really ensure that all of our students not only have a sp safe space within their classroom, but outside of the classroom, getting on the school bus, and having the flag there. I know it's meant a lot in my classroom. I've had parents, um, students of mine, tell me that having the pride flag there means so much to them and they'll tell me their stories about their children um, suffering and so strongly support this and let's keep it going and make sure it's really happening in all of our classrooms and all of our schools and that um, it's visible to all of our community thank you Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez and Board of Trustees. As you know, my name is Jen Salinas Holtz. I'm a member of the LGBTQ plus community. I'm a parent of two PVUSD middle and high school students and a PVUSD staff person who wor works closely with LGBTQ plus youth as a Gay Straight Alliance advisor at three schools. And I serve on the PVUSD LGBTQ task force. You are voting again today on a resolution to recognize October as LGBTQ History Month. 
I'd like to thank you again for your record of supporting LGBTQ plus students in our district and for voting to affirm their identities by honoring LGBTQ History Month. Visibility is crucial to the well-being of marginalized youth and for LGBTQ plus students, seeing themselves and people like them reflected in their school curriculum has a lasting positive impact on their mental health and well-being and their sense of safety at school. Seeing the rainbow pride flag flying at all school sites, which you all unanimously supported with a board resolution in February 2021, has been an important show of support and has absolutely contributed to LGBTQ plus and ally students' sense of inclusion and safety at school. Students who don't feel safe at school are not able to focus on academics, so making schools safer and more welcoming for LGBTQ plus students directly impacts their academic success. We currently have Gay Straight Alliance clubs in most PVUSD high schools and middle schools and at least two elementary schools. They provide safe spaces for LGBTQ plus students and their allies to feel, feel supported and valued. Many LGBTQ plus and gender diverse kids know who they are at a young age, sometimes as young as preschool. Our GSA clubs are a lifeline for some of these students because they have a space at school where they know they are safe to be themselves free of bullying and harassment. Yesterday, October 11th, was National Coming Out Day. Coming out as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, non-binary, queer, or an other identity is an act of courage, and LGBTQ plus kids deserve to not only be tolerated and accepted, but celebrated for having the courage to proudly be themselves. Thank you for your support in helping to make our schools safer and more welcoming for our most vulnerable students. Hello, trustees and uh, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, President Serpa. Good to see you all. My name is Bobby. Uh, many of you know me. Uh, I have three students, third grade, eighth grade, tenth grade in the district. I am also a teacher in the district. Uh, with those hats, I want to say thank you for bringing this forward tonight. Uh, but I also want to put on a different hat tonight. I'm also a pastor and a faith leader in our community. Um, in my graduate studies, I actually uh, got a master's certificate in sexuality and religion. And uh, I tread lightly with the topic, but want to come tonight because I know that in our majority culture, in our schools, even in this boardroom, there have been voices um, that have been less than positive and have weaponized faith. And so I want to be here as a voice of love and of light and inclusion to thank you from uh, faith community leaders. And I wanted to come not just, uh, and I wanted to encourage also uh, students who are here, who hear those voices. Um, that there are voices of love and light and inclusion and invitation and to listen to those and block out uh, the negativity. Um, I did want to represent not just myself, but uh, many of my friends in the community. And so if I, I can maybe leave this behind for you, but uh, signed by 12, uh, about a dozen faith community leaders from Christian, Buddhist, and Jewish uh, faith communities um, and say, I'll get through what I can in 40 seconds. As clergy and faith leaders in the community, we want to thank the PBUSD School Board for bringing forward a resolution to affirm LGBTQ plus history month in our schools. We recognize and affirm the value and dignity of each and every one of the LGBTQ plus students in our county as they are. In the wake of don't say gay laws in other states, the visibility and support of LGBTQ plus students is, one of, the most, uh, is of the utmost importance. And we as faith leaders from multiple traditions join you in supporting students as they learn about important contributions to our history and discover the fullness of who they are, finding pride in their identities. Um, signed by myself, Reverend Robbie Olson, Reverend uh, Ziggy Rendler Bregman, Rabbi Paula Marcus, Reverend Eugene Bush of Santa Cruz Zen Center, uh, Peg Chamaria, J.D. Doyle, Beverly Brook, Sherry Talmadge, a few others. Thank you so much for doing this tonight. Thank you. Do we have any comments from our board? No. <laughs> So, as many of you already know, I teach and um, today in particular, the case I was working with stood out. I was helping them through a case that had to address the patient's underlying anxiety before they could provide appropriate health. Why do I share I know what my life is. You know, where, like, none of, none of my I wasn't out didn't tell anybody that I was by and even then there are those who claim that we should focus on and ignore issues but 
as if they are somehow peripheral to student life. But they simply aren't. The world that we come from provides When our students' fundamental identity is supported, their learning is supported. That is a focus on that goes beyond what is I fully and enthusiastically support this resolution. Any other comments? Yeah, I'd like to second your motion. And um, I want to apologize. A few months ago, there were some very bigoted members in the audience who came forward and said a lot of horrible things to a group of kids who were here who were representing BLBT. And um, it, was, it was unfortunate, and it was a real shame. And, and I'm sorry that that happened. So we're very happy to support them tonight. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, anyone opposed? Motion carries 601 with um, Christy Acosta absent from her seat. Item 8.4, approved resolution 222319, Filipino American History Month. Yes, yeah, so thank you. So as we've been saying tonight, our community is so much richer because of the diversity in which we have within our community. So Trustee Shocker um, brought this forward. So I appreciate her bringing this forward and working with community members on it. Um, I will read um, some of it in regards to the Filipino Heritage Month. Um, so whereas the Pajaro Valley is where thousands of immigrant Filipino farm workers came, to settle, um, known as the Hmong generation. The, Mongo, the Hmong, Hmongs were the first generation of Filipinos who arrived in California's Central Coast during the 1920s and 1930s and had to endure harsh conditions, racial unrest, and discrimination. And whereas providing an opportunity to examine Filipino American history and culture, Filipino American History Month, highlights the achievements and contributions of Filipino Americans and the economic, cultural, social, and patriotic contributions that are made in the countless ways towards the development of the state and country. And whereas the Watsonville riots, were in, which was a period of racial violence and socioeconomic tensions in our local agricultural community and involved altercations between Filipino American farm workers and local residents opposed immigration, which led to the death of Fermin Gobera, a young Filipino American who was shot and killed during the riot. Whereas Filipino American Heritage Month honors the history of Filipino American solidarity in the fight for equity and justice and serves to preserve local history through projects like the Gobera Project, followed by the community organizer, um, Dios. Um, Roy um, Rocio Jr. and Watsonville in the Heart, Digital Archives and Memories of the Filipino Women's Club, established by Mongresario Nena um, Aliminana, and, and I'll skip through, and whereas celebrate the cultural enrichments and historical contributions of Filipino Americans to our nation. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District calls upon other school districts, schools, and educators to observe the month of October with appropriate ceremonies, activities, and programs to bring awareness of the significant role Filipinos play in American history. So, have it be resolved that by we recognize Resolution 2023 Filipino American History Month, and mark the achievements. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Do we have any speakers? Muriel? Hi, everyone. I swear this is the last time I'll be up here. <laughs> um, I wasn't actually planning to speak on this item, but I saw it on the agenda last night, and I felt so strongly about it because I was born and raised in the Philippines for about eight years before coming here at Watsonville. And being here in this small community, it's predominantly Hispanic. And so I wasn't able to be exposed to that same kind of culture that I was at home. 
back in the Philippines. And I was able to attend this um, Filipino American History Month festival that was hosted by the Tupere Project. And I was honored to be um, one of their speakers. Like I, I, I recited a poem that I wrote in my psychology class about growing up in the Philippines. And also it talked about colorism and being prideful about your language and where you came from. And I just wanted to strongly advise you to pass this resolution. <laughs> because um, it's really important here, and I got to meet and see so much, so much of that community that I missed so much at the festival. And it's amazing that this was brought up today, and I happen to be here, so <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Muriel. We're really glad to see you at the podium. I'd like to make a, actually, do we have any questions? Speakers, comments? Denshaq? I just wanted to comment. Um, thank you to the Watsonville of the Heart Project and the Tabera Project for bringing to light our need for um, teaching and advocating for and learning about Filipino American history. And I was able to be at the festival for a short time, and it was a wonderful festival, and they did a really good job for bringing the first festival here in the plaza, and I'd like more of those events happen. And I just also want to commend PVUSD for their ethnic studies program and continuing to work on the ethnic studies program, including um, our Filipino community in those. And I'd like to make the motion to approve it, but I know we have a couple of comments. I would just like to say thank you, PVUSD, for bringing up and recognizing Filipino American History Month. Uh, the, Filo the Filipino American community of the Pajara Valley are an important part of our valley and our history. They were some of the first field workers. They were also American soldiers. They're our family members. Um, they were my classmates, and they're our friends. But I also wanted to recognize the name of Mr. Tabasa. Um, Mr. Tabasa gave, I believe, 30 years to the Pajara Valley Unified School District and he wasn't my math teacher, but I heard, I, heard, I heard him from down the hall. When I attended E Hall from 1993 to 1996, I know he passed away. I want to say recently, but I think within this last year, and so I just wanted to mention the name, um, Mr. Tabasa. Thank you. So um, I'll second this motion. I have um, four daughters, all my bonus daughters is from the Philippines, so we have a lot of and um, and all those in favor? Aye. 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 One opposed? Motion carries 601 with B. Yep, we have a item 8.5, approve a resolution, 20 college and Good evening, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, and the Pajaro Valley community. Um, Pajaro Valley Unified School District recognizes that College and Career Awareness Week, and with which we are making week, is an important part of promoting a college-going culture, and the proposed resolution expresses the importance of higher education. College Awareness Week is observed annually during the, the full week prior to Cabrillo College's College and Career Night. This year, PBUSD has chosen to expand to two weeks, which move towards uh, the alignment of an entire month of October with the county for um, hopefully the following year. All schools are encouraged to participate and have been provided resources to bring excitement, opportunity, and information around college and career on their campuses. Along with counselors, UCSC, EAOP access centers will participate with college activities and events. One of the uniting events is Monday, October 24th, the College and Career Family Night at Cabrillo College. This celebration is sponsored by the Santa Cruz County College and Career Collaborative, which offers additional resources to students and families related to college and career readiness. And with that, I will read the resolution that we are hoping to get approved. Is Moriel still here? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, 
Whereas the vision of Pajaro uh, Valley Unified School District is to graduate all students, college, career, and life ready. And whereas PVUSD has demonstrated its ongoing commitment to establishing a college prepared culture through our yearly partnership with UCSC and EAOP to establish access, college, and career centers in every middle school and high school, regardless of gear up funding. And whereas PVUSD has established both dual enrollment courses and articulated courses with Cabrillo College to provide PVUSD students with an opportunity to earn college credit while in high school. And whereas College and Career Awareness Weeks are a countywide effort to recognize the importance of going to college, and whereas teachers, counselors, students, and support staff at district sites use the weeks to talk about opportunities for higher education, and whereas the connection between a college degree and economic stability has been exhaustively documented, making college access and preparation a social and economic justice issue, and whereas educators and community partners giving students information and training on higher education helps more students apply to college, and whereas PVUSD believes in the family and community partnerships to support our students in their post-graduation plans, and whereas our community recognizes and supports its students' quest for continuing education. Uh, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Board of Trustees proclaims October 17th, um, October 17th to October 28th, 2022, to be College and Career Awareness Week, and be it further resolved that the Pajaro Valley Board of Trustees strongly encourages all members of our community to join with it in personally expressing the importance of an education beyond high school in order to fully contribute to the vitality of their community. Thank you and hoping for uh, this resolution to be approved. Thanks, Christine. Do we have any speakers? Okay, any comments from the board? I'll make a motion to approve this unbelievably good resolution for college and career weeks. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 601 with. Item 8.7, the Williams Quarter 1 report. Did I skip? Eight. So thank you so much. So this is a resolution in support of Proposition 28. So if you, I was reminded by one of our VAP teachers um, today at Council, though, um, during my conversation with the superintendent, she reminded me and all the teachers that were there that there actually is no opposition to this proposition. So she said there was no reason for anyone to vote no because she said, look at it. There's um, so she did um, recognize, which I want to also recognize that the USD are ahead of the game in terms of the work that we're doing. So we already, because of when we received our LCAP funding many, many years ago now, um, when we went out to the community and said what's important, they said that the music and the art was important. And so part of our LCAP plan, we already are dedicating um, $6 million over $6 of annual funding. We have 43 visual and performing art teachers right now um, that really um, go across all grades to ensure that we're providing that access. Um, and so we also are only one of school districts um, in California that are supported by the Save the Music Foundation for our commitment to provide 45 minutes worth of music instruction to every single element child as of next. Um, and so what this will do, this proposition does two things that I think are important. One, it does provide us additional funding. So as if you read the proposition, what you know is it doesn't actually increase um, any tax, but it reallocates um, some of the funding under Proposition 8. Um, according to how well the, the state is doing, um, then it will depend on the funding um, statewide, um, everywhere from um, $800 million to $1 billion in a fiscal year, not importantly, not all for us. Um, but throughout the schools, um, throughout the, the state of California. 
Um, but another thing that it will require to do is once the districts receive that funding, they are going to have to allocate um, a portion of that funding on a continuous basis to the art. So as we know and ha happened throughout the state of California um, in the early 200s or 2000s, um, 2000s uh, many people took away the arts and music programs um, and they were the first to downsize. So what this would do is it would make it a core subject which would require us to that regardless of um, any type of funding challenges that we have. And so um, because of the additional funding and also our commitment to the whole child, whole family, um, I ask that the board support um, this resolution um, of Proposition 28. Do you have any speakers? Any comments? Motion. In a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Item 8.7, no, yes, item 8.7, Williams Quarter 1 Report, 2022, by August. President DeSerp, a Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, this is our quarterly report for Quarter 1 for the school year 22-23. Um, part of the Williams settlement is that it requires the district to have a complaint process, which we do, and the complaint process is in the three areas of instructional materials, facilities, and teacher assignments and vacancies. So for quarter one, uh, and then we have to report those to the board. So for quarter one, we have zero complaints in any of those three areas. I report, you approve quarterly report. Thank you. Are there any speakers? Anyone want to make Aye. Opposed? Any? M8.8 for education science and USB. Good evening, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, tonight, I have the privilege and pleasure of bringing forward the following item for your approval this evening. As a result of our ELOP funds, our district this year will be able to pay the cost of our outdoor education science school for either our fifth or sixth grade students at all of our sites. Um, typically, all of our sites don't always attend the outdoor science um, school, so this is a great and exciting um, venture for us. Um, no cost this year will be requested from parents or families and the students will not have to do fundraising for this um, event. So when I do want to thank um, our director of extended learning, um, Jennifer Bruno, because as she was able to confirm that we would be able to pay for this and fund it through ELOP, we went through together and identified any sites who had not had access or had not signed up yet, because normally they do it by a site by site basis. And so she was able to, we were able to identify sites and she was able to reach out and we were making sure that sites were able to sign up. So you will notice that there are two sites that are not on this list because this is our um, county um, science camp. The first one you will notice is Hall District who had already signed up for a different science camp. So they will have that outdoor science experience paid for also through ELOP funds, it is just not the, the county program. And the second one you'll notice is McQuitty Elementary School, and they had not signed up yet. So um, again, we are thankful for um, Jennifer Bruno because she was able to reach out and secure three um, day trips, right, that reflect and mirror the, the program that the students would be getting if it was overnight. Um, the county and um, other camps that are offered um, outside of our county, they are all filled up due to the schools getting out of the pandemic, right? And everyone's now adventuring off and feeling safer to go out there. So we are on a bunch of waiting lists, um, and we are first um, in line for if somebody cancels from a Quiddy school in our own county also. So without further ado, again, I would like to request your approval for, um, 
for this um, board item. Any speakers? Ready? Good evening again, Board of Trustees. Um, I do want to speak to this item, but I, I just have to say I'm actually absolutely speechless. I just cannot comprehend how this board lacks the sensitivity to see the actual harm and hypocrisy in passing unanimously a resolution that celebrates Christopher Columbus and the colonization of indigenous peoples, immediately preceding a resolution supporting a mural of indigenous Ohlone peoples in this community, I, it's just flabbergasting to me. And harmful, truly harmful. What I wanted to say in regards to this agenda item, um, Mr. Clappenbach just brought up, is the fact that McQuitty Elementary is not being offered the same experience that the rest of our schools are being offered in that overnight experience at a science outdoor school. Um, Mr. Clappenbach mentioned that they didn't sign up until it was too late. McQuitty Elementary currently does not have an academic coordinator. They have a principal who is trying to run that school, a new principal, I should say, to the best of her ability. And from my understanding from that staff, they were not even notified until recently of this opportunity. It is unacceptable to me that one of our schools is not being provided this opportunity that the rest of our fifth and sixth graders are being provided. As a former fifth grade teacher, Science camp was something we spent the entire year looking forward to. It was something that we came back from as a bonded group. It was an unmatched experience. And I, I really just, I would hate to see one of our sites um, not be provided that experience, especially when we have this opportunity to pay for it. A lot of what we did as fifth grade teachers was fundraising, and now we don't have we don't have to do that part. So I would really hope we could actually provide that. I know that there are different days and times and things like that involved, but um, I'm here on behalf of our McQuitty students and teachers. Thank you. So, um to um, clarify what the be right but about it that you had on yes so they have three different days between March and May where they go to the same camp that are offered through the county and instead they take a day trip there and do similar events and so those dates are confirmed as we wait on the wait list for the other opportunities for overnight also, so we're on wait list. We have. Yeah, so that's why I want to thank Jennifer Bruno again because she has looked outside of our county and she's actually um, waiting uh, um, to, con to hear the results from another, uh, from another camp six hours away. Salute. These really they use. I would have to check on that. I don't want to yeah. give out. Yeah, right? That's where I went when I was. So, but there are other camps. Better I find another camp, better one, and the there. We are on wait list for those two. <laughs> like I said, the other, all the districts are huddling over. These are the camp, the three day camp experience is as a, sorry is an experience that many of our sites went to last year because of the pandemic, right, and COVID um, numbers. And so they had to switch to a three-day where the bus came and picked them up and, get, and provided the experience for them last year. Um, Jennifer, you have 
will be moving forward. At this point, it would be a year-to-year -year, um, outlook looking at the funding source. Um, Jennifer Bruno and I have already discussed making sure, and we've already spoken to the county too, to make sure if we are able to fund this, that we don't get ourselves in this situation next year, that we have a process where they're working with us instead of individual sites, so we can provide access to all of us. I think it's an exciting opportunity. Something's funded. I think we're able to track That's exactly why we went through, and we wanted to make sure everybody had signed up. If they don't typically go, we wanted to ensure that all of them. What about the issue with? We should be provided the same act. I think I read. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, maybe check into Camp Sea Lab. It's not a week-long camp, but it's um, three days and two nights. And that might be an option um, because it's not a week long. They might have some availability. And that's here um, in Africa. And that, that is where um, one of our sites sure. is. But thank you. Oh, I'm just a, just an, another idea. What about the, is the Buddhist retreat? Do, do they do sleep over there? Something like, I forgot the name of the. The land of the medicine Buddha. Yeah, I think so. isn't that a? I don't know. Or just like weekend thing, and maybe. I am not sure, but the science camps that we're checking out or sending yeah. our students to, they're actually aligned with their science. Yeah. And well, I was just thinking about yeah. something, thinking outside the box. And like I said, Jennifer Bruno, she is very, very resourceful. She met with the fifth grade teachers from Equity yesterday, and she is out there diligently working. You know who? Okay, I'm just going to give one more. Um, Sarah Leonard's husband, Jeremy, has a science based educational school up in Mount, I think he uses Montatoyan. Now, that might, you might want to. Absolutely. Okay, so we have something before us really great, and we're going to try to fix the answer from Equity. But first, motion. One second. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Any? And this is I three point nine November ninth. Yeah, so staff respectfully request if we can reschedule our board meeting, it should normally be on November ninth. And we're asking it to be rescheduled to November sixteenth. It will also allow us to have it more in the middle of the month, um, as we only have one board meeting in November and um and so we'll provide us a little bit more coverage. So we're asking for that reschedule. Um, I, I am in. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed? and empty. Good evening, President of the Board and Dr. Rogers. I'm Lisa Gary, Assistant of Secondary Education. And along with me this evening, um, 
E.C. Klappenbach, our Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Education. And this evening, we are back once again to provide part two of our district-wide data and MTSS update and report. So um, just as a reminder and a connection piece and our purpose, we have our um, target for student success, with which this is definitely um, focused upon. And as we look at our MTSS, our multi-tiered multi systems of support, we have that all students receive that universal instruction and core support, where some of our students need a little bit more, right? So they need that supplemental support above and beyond that universal. And then for, for a few of our students, they not only need our universal, they need our supplemental, and then they also need our intensified program support. So, and then on the right side, there is our MTSS um, image that represents um, our, our MTSS in um, PVUSD. And at the center of it is our problem solving cycle as we look at not only the academic piece, the social, emotional in the center, and the behavioral side of the whole child and the supports that we provide tonight. We will be focusing on the behavioral. So one of those, that middle section right there, and there will be three um, data points that we will be focusing on, suspensions and expulsions, chronic absenteeism, and then last but not least, our PBIS tiered fidelity inventory. And so we're gonna start off with just a, a glimpse once again in the classroom, and this is a fourth grade classroom um, at Radcliffe Element. We can go ahead I was and, say. and come back and we can play it for you next time when we're All right. <laughs> <laughs> we have to we have to get our singing voices a little bit ready. But it is a group of student leaders at their site that are their PBIS um, leadership team from their student from that site. And they have a pride song about the rad pledge that they were going to show us. All right. So once again, these are the three data points that we're going through. But here are a few images that, is, images that represent the supports and expectations um, with behavior. And so part of PBIS does help us set consistent expectations that we, that we teach and model and help support. And you can see Bradley Bears. They have their We Use Our Paws, right? And then you can also see just below it, they actually wrote a book that acts out, that has bears acting it out and that they read in the classrooms to their students. And then on the left, you also see um, some, some more innovative practices where they're recognizing students for their behavior and, and citizenship at McQuitty. And you see the principal there with one of their teachers because they are the must. All right, so with that said, so we'll start with in-school suspensions. Um, this is the um, number of students who, um, singleton students, so they're unduplicated um, over the last three years. The middle column represents the year that we were in distance learning, but we had uh, zero. In-school suspensions, um, what it is, it's used to um, where school students are not at home, they're at school for restorative practices and to repair harm. Um, the one thing to note that we were slightly up last year as compared to 2019-20, but as a reminder, um, our schools closed in February, so that the 19 to 20 wasn't even a complete year. 
that students were on campus. One of the things to note that when we're looking at it, one in five of these students that were in, um, in school suspension, they were a student with a disability. We look at the percentage, we um, look deeper into the, the, the data when we look at the suspension percentage of students with disabilities. Um, we look and we see that there are some schools that went up and down. Um, the majority of the schools did go down from 2019 to 2019-20 um, to 21-22. There are only five schools out of the 23 that actually increased the percentage of students with in-school suspension and with students with disability. Um, this uh, shows that the need for further restorative practices that take place. The out-of-school suspension, same thing. It's the, the number. Um, there was an increase from 2019-20 to the 21-22 school year. Um, that number on the bottom is 613. Uh, the six is right on the line in case you couldn't see that. Same thing. Um, we look, there is, a, um, there is an increase, but as a reminder, the 1920, um, it was in February that we did go home. Um, it actually was surprising to me that there wasn't a larger increase considering um, coming back and the students um, regulating back into the classrooms after being home for over a year um, and a half. Um, in this case of out-of-school suspensions, 30% of the students um, that were suspended had disabilities. Um, as a reminder, last year we added LCAP goal number eight, which was specifically geared for students with a disability. We did this as one of the reasons why is because of the number of suspensions with students with a disability to make sure that we are monitoring and we're keeping progress on how we're doing and how, what we're doing to make sure that that decreases. If we look at the percentage, it's about 50% of schools um, increased um, the percentage of students with disabilities that were out of school suspensions and about 50% decrease. Expulsions. We had an increase from going, if you look, from 1819 to 2122. Um, 1920, we had very few. And then 21, of course, 20 to 21, that's when we were in distance learning. This year, we are at a, um, we have decreased from last year with only one um, expulsion as of this year. Um, and so this is a decrease from last year. So we are on a positive trend. We look at chronic absenteeism. The red line on the bottom um, is looking over the week of school. That is from last year. Um, looking at this, you can really see how COVID had an impact in our students attending schools. There is a large difference between the blue, which is 1920, the yellow, which is 2021, and then last year with the um, students attending school. When we look at the graph of the chronic absenteeism and to be considered a chronic absentee, a student, it's missing 10% of the year or more. And that's when you are deemed um, a student that is chronic absenteeism. Uh, the top line um, from, let me have that, those numbers. Um, 1920, 2021 is the middle, and the bottom is the 21, 22 school year. So we did have an increase in chronic absenteeism. But then if you look at the blue graph, that is the um, number of excused absences. So even though we had increased um, number of students who had chronic absenteeism, we also had increased number of students who had excused absences, which would mean lean to illness. So this next slide um, shows attendance rate by school site. And so there was quite a, there was a difference in ranges from site to site. And so most of the time, um, the sites were within two percentage, um, percentage points um, between uh, and across years. But some examples that show the differences would be if you look at um, Lakeview Middle School, they had 93%, then they went to 94%, and then last year they went um, back down to 93%. So they were just one, one point off, stayed pretty consistent. You look at Ohlone Elementary School, they were consistently at 93% for the last three years. And then taking um, a venture down to Watsonville High School, they, were a, they went from 95%, 95% to 94. So you can see what, however they, they fluctuated, they were within one or two percentages um, <clears throat> away from where they were pre-pandemic. <clears throat> and then this next slide shows 
attendance by grade level. And so you can notice if you look um, at the top that we, our youngest students do have um, lower attendance rates. And this is um, a pattern from the past also. So we have work to do to make sure the parents know how important it is that our youngest students do um, come to school every day, right? Getting those habits started um, at the earliest age. And then as we're looking at um, by student population group, um, you will also notice that our special education students have a lower, tend to have a lower um, degree of attendance. And then, but you will notice as a highlight that our RFEP students at 95%, they actually surpass all of our other um, groups of students, which is telling us that we know that that's a good thing for our students to get redesignated, right? And they're eager to come to school if we can get them at that point. And as we're moving into our PBIS tiered fidelity inventory, as we're looking at this, this is how um, we measure and identify the level of, of recognition and the, the level of tiered support that our sites have with PBIS. And PBIS really is part of that MTSS framework where we are working on those positive behavioral supports for, and interventions. And so if you look back to 1718, we did not have any sites recognized as we moved and provided more professional development and support with systems work. We moved to having five sites identified. And then 1920, during the pandemic, they actually did not recognize sites. And they still had the tool, but because we were right in distance learning, um, the state did not provide that. And so this last two years, we have gotten back into it with our site teams, providing professional um, learning um, and support. And so as we're looking at that, we moved into 26 schools, were recognized. And if you look at it, our goal is to get to that platinum that platinum level. And so we have been putting in those tiers. You can see that we had um, an increase of silver. So that means it's like the Olympics, right? We're moving from the bronze, the silver, the gold, the platinum. And so we do have an increase of sites being recognized at higher levels. And um, it was a great accomplishment this last year as we came back. Um, we were able to recognize all 100% elementary sites and 100% of our middle school sites were recognized. And though, so as you heard a lot of the data tonight, we also have behavioral and safety action plans, just like we did for academics, right? So to highlight some of the, the, um, the pieces of the action plan, as you can see, we definitely want to continue our monthly PBIS and SEL meetings with site teams and supporting them. Um, we also, if you look down um, at our proactive community circles, we are working towards, we are providing our um, social emotional counselors are also working in conjunction with our psychologists and being able to really use their resources and ex expertise as a team um, and to also offer social skills group um, through that time too to support our students. And a real focus, as you notice, on alternate alternatives to suspension, right? To keep our students at school so they can keep learning, right? And then on the, on the right side, you see that the, the safety opportunities, right? As you know, you've heard all about our ALICE trainings, right, that we're moving forward with, and Student Services um, is, is moving on that weekly and has a schedule set up. And then we also have um, additional um, safety cameras that are being monitored, safety plans, we also have the countywide MDT um, team meeting. And then, of course, at the top, we are all um, aware of the gaggle, right? The gaggle alert and, and for our students and the Stop It app for all of our stakeholders to report um, any bullying or other unsafe behaviors also. To say, um, you may have heard recently the update in the safety cameras. One of the features is that you could actually um, have the camera, you can focus in on a, an individual um, person, and that camera would be able to track them throughout the day. 
there are a lot of different features on the cameras that's helping us when we need to explore different situations that have to happen on camera. And then as we move into those tiered um, levels of support at tier one, that which all of our students in site receive, we have our PBIS implementation with our um, TFI sewn to grow, right? And you will see that with our social emotional, but it also helps with our behavioral access um, to student voice opportunities, which you've already been hearing about, and access to enrichment, athletics, clubs, especially during unstructured times, right? So you hear about, from elementary, you hear about the play work. From middle school, we know we have some sites that have partnered with PAL. And so making sure that we have those, those opportunities for our students. And then as we move in, for some of our students, they need strategies and support, such as check-in and check-out, which helps students keep track and focus on um, themselves and reflecting on their behavior and sets them up with a mentor that ch they check in with each part, different parts of the day. Um, and then we also have, like I mentioned, social skills groups that are flexible as needed and responsive to, uh, to the needs. And then our, our um, growing implementation with restorative practices. So we are repairing harm and building those communities within our um, classrooms, but also um, individual communities too, so we can repair harm and um, also improve behavior, right? And then that mentoring piece, making sure that our students have that special person to check in with and help them and be their champion, right? And, um, and role model. And then for our intensified needs, sometimes our students need those intensified support too. And so making sure that we are giving them specialized evidence-based interventions and then making sure we're connecting those programs um, to the regular school day for their students and monitoring the effectiveness. So we don't just keep doing something that's not working for our students. We're actually looking at it and improving it along the way. That said, any questions and discussion time? Followed by. Good evening again. Um, so, what do I want to say to this item? This whole entire presentation feels like a hat on the back that is completely devoid of actual connection to what is happening in classrooms and on. I heard from a teacher today who has been teaching for over 30 years and over eight years in this district, and she said, I have never feared going to work more than I have this school year. That's a very poignant statement, and I hope you're taking it serious. When I ask teachers about MTSS and their experience with MTSS, this is what I hear. I don't know what that is supposed to do. All I do is fill out paperwork that gets turned into the office, and nothing happens from it. If you want to know how these things are really working on campuses, in classrooms, and with students, you need to ask the real stakeholders. Those are the people working directly with students. I don't believe that having a multi-tiered system of support is in any way, shape, or form a bad thing. I think that is an excellent thing for our community. God knows we need it. We have a lot of students who need multi-tiered systems of support. But saying that we're providing it without providing systems of actual support, without providing resources, we have classrooms where there are no IAs. We have special ed unsafe situations. That's not what this is representing. So I hope you actually take some time to ask those who are really, who are really Experiencing what's happening in schools. Thank you. Okay. Um, between the changes in uh, management at the DO and, and at my site, I feel like we have a really good opportunity to uh, 
make this meaningful, to make it feel real. And I, I feel like Renaissance was doing this before it was ever a thing. Before MTSS ever came, we were already doing this. And then um, also when I we had um, the director of student services come talk to us about PBIS, and it was I was conflicted because on the one hand I agreed with so much of what he said. On the other hand, I was like, well, is the district really going to do it? Because when when previous managers cast aside our program, um, they basically they 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 abrogated those principles, and that's kind of what is has brought me here so many times. Um, we one of the things that came out of the meeting that we had was a, a veteran teacher as we we're discussing recreating the wheel. A veteran teacher is like, wait, we have this. We have a stakeholder informed program that is highly documented and covers all this. And then um, a CSEA uh, member in the, in the room said, oh, well, Michelle said she doesn't support that. And I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I feel like Renaissance never got the chance to come here and present what we really are, the way we, we were misrepresented last year. Um, and I, I feel like that's kind of one thing I would want, especially now that we have a new principal who doesn't know um, what, how good we've been. I'd like to have the veterans of Renaissance come, present to Michelle or Dr. Rodriguez, present to Dr. Rodriguez and um, uh, the principal, DO leaders, and you know, at least, at least probably our rep or our uh, board trustee, and maybe, maybe one other, or it may be to the to everyone. Do it, do it the way Shouse did, and make give us time on the agenda. Maybe closed session, but I feel like we should get our chance to show how good this can be it would be great for for you guys too because we can mitigate some of these things we were really we were better at attendance and expulsions and suspensions before thank you yeah are there any for our younger how think yes I, I think to answer that you're you're absolutely right the the immature the system the immune system is a lot more immature I think what we are trying to ask of parents is, and I'm guilty of this as well, as a parent, when they're younger, they're like, well, if they miss, you know, a couple of days, it's not that big of a deal. And it's not until they're older that we realize that they probably shouldn't miss school. Like my high school, I'm like, no, you can't, you can't miss school. But when they're young, and I know, you know, some people say, well, we'll just go on a quick trip. And it's easier to think that way when they are younger. And that's what we want to um, try to on this one too so i'm glad you brought this up because we definitely don't want our sick students coming in we know the younger right. ones from being a kindergarten teacher and a principal this is a common thing but then we also get the parents that are like oh so and so just didn't want to get up or they're battling them too and so we need to partner with them and how to support them getting their student to school and being able to Uh, you know <laughs> absolutely but again we know that the uh, that the research tells us too that it does start from kindergarten and the students that have that tend to have that chronic absenteeism it starts there and they're the ones that drop out the most so that that balancing act I, yeah. Just point of order. I, I agree with Jen with COVID, right? People 
precaution. I believe you're talking about the out of stock, if I remember the data yeah. correctly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there. So um, the we have a new student services department who is working with each school site and looking at their past data to determine what needs need what needs need to take place and what changes. One of the things that we are working on is an actual discipline handbook, which is a guidebook for administrators to look at if a student possibly does this, what are some of the things that can take place in lieu of a suspension? The sometimes the easiest thing to do is to have the problem disappear, which would be an out of school suspension. But that doesn't necessarily make it the right decision because the student possibly would continue uh, with whatever it is that they did and repeat it. So we really are looking at how do we educate not the student and the parent to make sure that they understand what it is that they did um, that they didn't do correctly and how they can sit more with the, the consequences and the actions so that we do not repeat the offense the the what the student does the um and also working with schools who did not have as many um uh practices in place to help with the restorative practices and um, to rebuild and Yeah. Um, from my opinion, the discrepancy is that we did not have a comprehensive behavior system that we used throughout the district. And when we came back, that um, school sites were left to do what they thought was best to do. And they may not have um, had somebody to bounce ideas off of or to talk about it, or somebody didn't go out to their school site to say, I'm seeing this trend on your school site. Let's take a look to figure out what's happening and what we can do about it. So um, we've already this year, a couple times when incidences were happening on school sites that were repeating, there's a team that actually went out, went, goes to the school site to look to first assess the, the school situation where those repeat offenses are happening, interview students in different capacities. Not only we get a check on the PBIS implementation that's in place, but kind of see it from the student perspective. And then after have a debrief with the administration and then to discuss strategies that we can put in place to mitigate the actions that we're seeing. And, and I started here. There was not a why not to deal with this was the goals limit experience doing their own it's huge out of school system maybe with visible on camp so, so we set about that bring a lot of training for our new administration now we have a the lot training of training or the guide oh both sounds like you're rewriting the guidebook put something in yeah so a the guidebook was created actually by secondary administrators last year at the beginning of the draft um, without in the discussion. So first we wanted to bring all the administrators together to say what's happening. Then it was um, taken over to look at it, to go further in detail, to add more restorative practices in it. And it's not necessarily if X student does this, this is the exact consequence, because it also is an individual decision looking at students because students are individual. Um, in terms of we have a new administrators, especially on the secondary level, and there are different opportunities for support. There is a um, monthly uh, assistant principal meeting 
and also a principal meeting, as well as a new administrator meeting that happens monthly to check in. And then also in terms of with student behavior, the biggest change is once we see that there is a pattern or things that are happening on the school site, then we do follow up with a, a team goes out to the school site to try to figure out what is going on to put the in place. And it is in support of the school and the administration. And who does that team from special services? Not special services. No. It's from um, student services. Student services. Yeah. And I've gone out. You've yes. got. Not all the time, but I. I Just our, our director I mean, of student services. Students. Yvonne Alcaraz, Dr. Yvonne. Oh, Alcaraz. yeah, right. New. Yes. The whole, the, the team is a, you have uh, Chrissy McLean and um, Mr. No, that was not a COVID that was year. Just, but I used to get every. already can I You guys know, you guys live and breathe mm -hmm. this very you know, when you're talking about what make. Yeah, so, so we, we are at site two with our teachers, and we're in classrooms and, and on those school sites, but our, um, we are building capacity on the site to be able to have those teams. So each site does have a PBIS team, so they're looking at the data across their campus, too, and they're coming up with solutions and looking at which students need what support, too. So that's part of building that system piece of it. Um, we also are offering, we have the monthly PBIS and SEL meetings, which Dr. Alcarez and um, ben, Mr. Ben Slider run. And so when they're looking at things too, they are building capacity with their teachers that are on those teams that come in with the administrator and with another person from their site. So they're also getting the training. They're, they're giving it back to um, their sites and building that capacity. So it's not always just we're looking at the data too, but then they're also having that distributed leadership at their school site. And that's across, if we're looking at academic, it's also when we're looking at behavior and SEL also. Yeah, after all of a 
on behavior or So I think it depends on the site, right? Because they are working on their processes and looking at their student needs. It also depends on if it's, a, if it's truly an escalated issue or it might be a classroom that needs coaching and guidance on tier one support, especially if it's across the, the classroom when there are issues. So it just depends. And then the sites also have the ability as they are having issues dealing with the with concerns and they put in interventions and support as they try to as best that they can address it it can it does move up our district wellness team too and so then we're looking at how how we can provide additional assistance completely Um, so we looked at our Excel um, have a course. What are we doing? So first of all, we know that whether we're talking about students with IEPs or we're talking about our general education population, a lot of um, students have come back dysregulated, right? Just like some adults too, as well. And so one of the, um, the supports we are providing is that safety care training and de-escalation training for um, different support staff across the way too, to be able to manage that. Some of the time, like Lisa was, was speaking to earlier, is sometimes it's easier just to send a student home, right? Than to actually help support the problem right, and the issue and peel back the onion and support it there. So that's our first step to help. It's the de-escalation of the situation. Um, and a lot of our students who may have a disability, um, especially the ones with poor behavioral concerns, or it, it is when the de-escalation part always didn't happen. And what happens is that then when, that, when the student gets very, um, high in their emotions, they're not able to come down, and so then they would do something where then the administration would feel that they would have, uh, they would have to go home on an out of school. Um, I think that's the number one thing. The second thing is that we do have um, folks that go into the classroom to look to see how if the, like, so if there is a student in the gen ed classroom, um, and we have student, uh, adults that go in to look to see if possibly um, there's some, a change that can be made within that classroom or something that the teacher's missing to help support that student to keep them um, calm. And so it's really figuring out um, what's the best support for the student. Um, and then with the, the goal number eight, that's part of what we are making sure that we do do it support with. Um. Then we have a highly collaborative um, team now between special services and student services, which is really exciting. They're there to support one another and to also support the campuses together and utilizing the expertise that we have with our social emotional counselors and our psychologists too to work together now and to provide those support. We'll be back for part three. <laughs> President, Sir for Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So this is um, making it pub known pu to the public that we are going to enter into negotiations with PBFT. The district is wanting to sunshine um, evaluations and then the reopeners article, as well as we'll be providing language for the articles that were previously. So this is just for the public to know and make comment if they have, if they wish. 
engage in negotiations with Yes. Thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So this is the Sunshine Proposal from Communication Workers of America, which are our representation for our substitutes. So they have engaged us in wanting to um, negotiate for the 22 through 25 school years. Um, so this is their initial Sunshine Proposal. And so again, make it known to the public that we will be engaging in negotiations. Acknowledge Janet, you, the Lagasse Culinary. And then also acknowledge donation if. Hi. Anyone? Why I moved? Hi. Anyone? Item session item eleven a next meeting will be October 26, 2022, and that we are now adjourned.